Every year we make another journey around the sun. 365 days. And over the course of 365 days, there are a lot of learning opportunities. And Shade Tree Church is just one of those that you come once a week to learn more about God or more about the Bible, more about yourself. And every year, as the calendar year winds down, I begin thinking about what is it that I want us to engage in. And sometimes that'll take us into different parts of the Bible. And I have never, ever been able to be that type of a speaker that wonders from week to week what I'm going to talk on. I have to have a plan of action. And so this year, I decided I was going to uh, plan out the first quarter of the year in the Gospel of John. And I thought, well, how do I approach this? The Gospel of John is 21 chapters long, many different paragraphs in it. And it is a wonderfully profound book, as we'll see as we travel through it. But then I was thinking about how different things inspire me. And in the back of my mind, there was a song that was recorded many years ago uh, by Van Morrison called Into the Mystic. And I thought, well, that's an interesting title. Because John is built on symbolism, many of us who venture into this book are venturing into mystery, and mystic can mean an encounter or an experience that we can't fully comprehend, or it might be those type of things that we experience that are a bit mystical in the sense that there's elements of mystery about what we experience. And so this song by Van Morrison got my, my wheels to turn, and um, I want you to give it a listen. And here's the info behind it. Um, it comes from the 1970 album Moon Dance, so it goes back to the 70s. Uh, some of you weren't maybe that old to experience the 70s like I did, but it's a ballad, and in it, the imagery is of a sailor at sea, and it's about his desire to return to the shore and to the lover that waits for him there back on land. And normally a foghorn signals danger, but for him it signals that the shore is near and that he's close to home. And when we think a little bit about God being the one that is calling us to shore, to meet him anew. I think the song has some profound elements to it, so I want you to give it a listen. than the sun Yeah, the bonnie boat was one as we sail into the mystic oh, I can now hear the sailors cry Smell the sea and feel the sky Let your soul and spirit fly Where that foghorn blows 
I will be coming home. Yeah, when the fog horn blows, I want to hear it. I don't have to fear it. You know I will be coming home Yeah, when that fog horn was blows I gotta hear it I don't have to fear it And I wanna rock your gypsy soul Just like way back in the days of old And together we will fold Come on, girl. So I thought that song reflected a little bit, not only the experience of a man desiring to get back to his love, but also the experience of human beings trying to get back in connection with God. These things are written that you might believe and that in believing you might have eternal life. Don't think of that as a duration of time. Also think of it as an experience of life the type of life that God has desired for us from the beginning of time. So here's where we're going to go over the next three months. I introduce to you the song. We're going to talk a little bit about symbolism in the Gospel of John. We're going to talk a little bit about seven statements made by the captain, Jesus himself, I am the bread of life, I am the true vine, I'm the resurrection and the life, those type of statements that are found. Only in John's gospel, ironically. Seven lights along the shore. These are qualities that we move to in the course of our life and over the coming months. And then several sailors on the quest. These interviews and encounters that Jesus have with different individuals like Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman that are found in John's gospel. Then stormy waters ahead. Uh, One of the things the Gospel of John develops quite poignantly is the conflict between the Pharisees and Jesus that ultimately leads to his arrest. And as we get close to Easter, which is in March this year, uh, we will see that um, Jesus was set up. It's an unjust type of um, trial that he goes through. And these stormy waters he felt deeply inside his soul. And it comes out in the text in a variety of different ways. And then lastly, the safe arrival to shore, where there is this idea of God overcoming all the troubled waters of life through the resurrection of Jesus. So that's the overall uh, kind of pattern that we're going to look at over the next few months. And ironically enough, Today, we're going to get through this part, these first four, and we're going to take three months for the last three, okay? So, here we go. Put your pants on, put your mind in gear, 
Sit up straight, as teachers will tell you, right? Okay, here we go. All right, symbolism in John's gospel. When you think about uh, symbolism, symbolism um, is something that communicates something through something else. So many times symbols kind of become part of the cultural experience. So if I did this, right, you'd have all kinds of ideas that come to your mind, and most of us would associate it with what? Peace, right? Okay, now, or Richard Nixon. <laughs> but um, a symbol takes on a life of its own. And it invites us into an experience or an encounter in different ways. So when we move into the mystic, by mystic I don't mean, you know, that you're somehow contemplating your navel or something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about you're moving into an encounter or an experience that allows light to shine where you can see things clearer than what you did before, okay? So having said that, symbolism plays an important part because it moves into every part of our life. There's a lot of symbols in life that we know what they mean if there is a P with a circle around it and a line through it, what does that mean? No parking, right? So you know and see symbols all the time. Well, Jesus picks up on this idea of symbolism, and the reason he uses symbolism in his ministry, and the reason John picks up on symbolism, is because symbols have a way of communicating something that doesn't take a lot of words, doesn't take a lot of verbiage to communicate. And so when we hear things like Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd, okay? To an agricultural, agrarian type of community, that's going to stir up all kinds of imagery because they saw shepherds all the time, right? Most of us don't see shepherds, right? We walk down the street in Willoughby, Ohio, and I haven't seen anyone watching over a flock of sheep, or at least not since the sheep lady passed away up on Euclid Avenue, right? Uh, if you don't know what I'm talking about there, there was a lady that had a house on Euclid Avenue in Willoughby that had a front yard full of sheep, and uh, there's apartments there now. But anyways, uh, so it's a symbol that doesn't communicate as much to us but it is a symbol that communicates a lot to those that listen to Jesus. All right. Hey, jo, jo, um, Johannine symbolism, the symbolism that John records, that's all we mean by Johannine, um, is kind of like concentric symbols that keeps working to the person of Christ. In other words, all of these things keep bringing Jesus into focus here. Each symbol gives us the permission to explore and experience an encounter with God. When John writes these words, he's not writing them only for his initial audience. He's writing them for those who will believe, for those who contemplate them. And that includes people that will live much later than when he writes. Symbolism sparks the imagination as well. And I think we'll see that as we get into it. There are certain things that are transcendent. There are certain things that invite participation. And there are certain things that we will never completely figure out. That's part of symbolism. But a symbol is a way of being present. And it brings the text to life. And here's what I mean. It invites us into an experience because Jesus, in the Gospel of John, will make seven statements. Okay, what did I say at the beginning? If anybody asks you about the Gospel of John, just say seven. <laughs> okay, because that's the way he outlines his book. Now, think about this for a moment. When someone is first beginning to explore the Christian faith, Many times, pastors and 
church leaders will say, well, you need to read the Gospel of John, okay? If you grew up in church, you'll find that the Gospel of John is considered to be kind of the simplest of the Gospels. And what I find is that probably isn't the best advice, okay? The Gospel of John is sort of like a swimming pool with a shallow end and a deep end. And for people that are kind of new to their faith, uh, to their faith, the symbolism that is used in the Gospel of John can be very powerful to people that don't know a whole lot about anything else, okay? It's sort of like the shallow end of the pool, maybe even the kiddie pool that you can wait around in and you appreciate it. But it had once been said, and I forget who the author is that said this, that the Gospel of John is shallow enough for a child to wade in, and it's deep enough for an elephant to swim. That there's different elements to it. If we only want historical facts about the life of Christ, the Gospel of Mark is probably the better suggestion. But the Gospel of John uses these symbols. Jesus will say at various points as he encounters those that are listening to him and those that are opposing him. I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I'm the gate for the sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm the way, the truth, and the life, and I am the true vine. Seven metaphorical statements that are all built on the sacred name of God. Remember when Moses ex experienced the burning bush encounter with God? And Moses is to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. And Moses says, well, what God should I say is demanding this? And God says, tell Pharaoh, I am has sent you. I am. Well, Jesus picks up on this idea and uses kind of the name of God and gives to us an ongoing connection to this God all the way back to creation as we saw in our reading out of John 1, but also to the Exodus experience, this God who desires for people to experience freedom and to experience worship and to experience love of God. So these seven statements, in many ways, are a portal for us to see Christ afresh. And sometime this year, you're going to need one of the statements that are reflected here. None of us know what's going to happen tomorrow. You might find that you'll need Christ at some point this year to be kind of the bread of life for you that you can feed on. At other times, you might find that you need Christ to be your resurrection in life because we understand that through the resurrection of Jesus, death is finally defeated and we have hope beyond this experience. So, as we find life out on the ocean, there are mystical moments, encounters, if you will, that we find in the Gospel of John. And how many are there? Seven, right? That's the answer. These seven mystical moments are given to us as a way of seeing how Jesus encountered other people. He does so with Mary in changing the water to wine. There's the healing of the royal official son, there's a healing of a paralytic. There's the feeding of the multitudes, walking on water, healing the blind man from birth, and finally raising Lazarus from the dead. And each encounter with Jesus there is connected in some ways back to some of these statements. For example, here when Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life in John chapter 11, that statement is made in the context of his friend Lazarus passing away unexpectedly, Jesus is not there, and Lazarus has two sisters, and these two sisters are kind of PO'd at 
uh, Jesus for not being there to be able to heal Lazarus before he died. And that's where Jesus will say, I am the resurrection and the life. And he goes on to raise Lazarus from the dead, but then to make a promise that there is resurrection for those of us who are not the Lazarus of this world, who encounter this powerful miracle in the moment, but it is waiting for us along the shore. And that is the last thing we want to talk about today. When you look up here at the table, the communion table that we will participate in in a couple moments, uh, there are lighthouses up here. I um, have always been fascinated with lighthouses. They are beautiful structures, but more importantly, they are those things that sailors needed to remain safe and to find their way home. So as I was putting Christmas ornaments away yesterday, uh, up in the crawl space, I saw these and I thought, ah, this fits perfectly into the theme. So we're going to keep these up over the months and remind ourselves that we all need these uh, encounters and experiences with Jesus, but we also need light along the way. And these seven lights along the shore are found in the Gospel of John. And there are different things that pop up in different ways and in different moments. Things like justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom, truth, and power. And I want to take a moment and uh, show you that by reading a few passages of Scripture that I think are important uh, to us as we prepare to encounter the uh, mystic in the Lord's table in a few moments. So let's talk about each of these, and this is where we'll finish this introductory message on John today. You know, it might be thought that the Gospel of John doesn't have a whole lot to say about justice, that is, fairness and rightness in the world, that he's more concer concerned about the spiritual. But if you kind of read in between the lines a little bit, you'll find that justice is found in the text. Um, the words of Jesus that are at the heart of his gospel tell us about life and tell us about love. So in John chapter 3, where we find the most famous verse that all of us quote out of the gospel of John, we understand that uh, indeed John 3.16 is something maybe that you have memorized <laughs> for a long time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And then it says this, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Now, we automatically think the idea is beyond this life, but it's talking about saving the world, the experience that we have in this world through Christ. It says here, for whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And here is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Now, this idea here of things like sin and evil in the world is something that is characterized by the image of darkness. This idea that the dark corners of this world have dangerous things that can happen. And these things that happen in the world can put not just our own self into precarious situations, but there are whole people groups many times that find themselves under the shadow of darkness and evil and sin and what we find is this all goes back to this idea of justice, not treating each other as human beings, but dehumanizing each other. And what we find Jesus doing is wanting to put the world to rights. He goes on in verse 20 of John 3, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed, their motives will be exposed. Now, what are the motives of human beings? It's always about the money, Lebowski. Okay? It's always about the money. What is most profitable? 
What is it that I can do to get an edge up on someone else? It doesn't matter how it ruins their life. And so we live in probably the most uh, uh, vulnerable part of life these days when we think about just litigation. The amount of things that are going on in our world so that we can somehow use the system that we have to sue people, to get rich. Everything is about money. And because of that, it leaves a lot of dark corners in the world. And we can't really expect to have a life of abundance without justice. And so sometimes in this gospel, and we're not looking at all of it, obviously, but it does come out in a variety of ways, that one of the things that Jesus wants to do is bring about a just and right world so that all people can experience the goodness of God and the abundance of life. In John chapter 9, there is this idea of blindness And Jesus is talking with the Pharisees, and he says to them, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who will see will be blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him say this, and asked, What are we blind to? And Jesus says, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. There is this ongoing image of light and darkness through the whole book and what we find is that it is there under this shadowy figure of the evil one in John chapter 12 there's a plot that develops to arrest and ultimately execute Jesus and even that is characterized as something that is dark it is something that is evil and Jesus will say to those that are listening in John 12. You're going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Believe in the light while you have the light so that you may have become children of light. Okay, so as we go through this, look for justice as a theme. Secondly, this is the one that... you'll find in various sections of the Gospel of John, and it's love. So I just turned to John chapter 12. The next chapter is quite interesting. This is where there's a turn that takes place in the Gospel of John. As soon as chapter 13 hits, the concentration is upon the Pharisees wanting to put their plot into effect. And the way they're going to do it is they're going to hire a guy by the name of Judas to... Uh, set up an arrest for Jesus uh, in the garden. Well, Jesus gathers his disciples into an upper room and has a Passover meal with them. And this is the way that text begins. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. And now listen to this phrase. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Isn't that a great phrase? He loved them to the end. He didn't give up on them, and he loved them through what he was going to experience. A couple chapters later, as he's prepping his disciples for his departure, he talks about love again, and he says this, my command, chapter 15, verse 12 is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one this than this to lay down his life for his friends. So love is a big theme. For God so loved the world. We just read that. Thirdly is spirituality. It has become more and more common, at least for me, When I sit down with a family after they've lost a loved one and I prep their memorial service for their loved one, I ask them, was your loved one religious? Okay? Because it helps me structure how I'm going to do the uh, memorial service. And this has become more common now than it was 35 years ago. 
And that is, know my dad, my mom, whoever it might be. They were not religious, but they were spiritual. That's become a common phrase, right? I'm not religious, but I am spiritual. And spirituality has, I think, sometimes uh, kind of develop this kind of a mystical idea behind it that we can encounter God without church, without religion, without learning about God, but it's kind of the experience in the moment that uh, we somehow feel uh, uh, and sense the presence of God. But one of the things the Gospel of John does is it keeps taking us back to Jerusalem, the city where all of these Jewish festivals take place. So you have the Feast of Tabernacles, you have the Feast of the Passover, and Jesus, being a good Jew, a Torah-observing Jew, went to Jerusalem on a regular basis to use the religious festivals as part of his spirituality to encounter God. So spirituality is something that we talk about in relationship to connection with God. It is done through kind of the religious festivals in the Gospel of John, But in chapter 15, maybe the best description of what true true spirituality is, is this image of the vine and the branches. He says in John chapter 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. But if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. You're You don't find the fruitfulness of life if you don't stay connected. So what spirituality is, is either through religious elements or even through personal experience. It's a way of connecting with God as a vine and a branch. Number four is beauty. By beauty, there is a theme that comes about in the Gospel of John. The first part of the Gospel of John is called the Book of Signs, these miracles that Jesus performs. But from chapter 13 all the way to the end, it's called the Book of Glory. The Book of Glory. God's glory is seen. His beauty is seen through the person of Jesus Christ. That theme begins in the very first chapter, but it really picks up steam in the latter part of the book. And John tells us, that we see the glory of God in the person of Christ because God tabernacled among us in the person of Jesus. The next one is freedom. Freedom is this idea, again, of being able to not be chained to something or someone else, but to find the freedom to flourish. In John chapter 8, this idea of freedom pops up You know, the philosopher Rousseau once said, man is born free, but is everywhere in chains. It's an interesting quote. We all know that freedom's important for human flourishing. And if there's not freedom, there's not flourishing. I think that's why uh, Maya Angelou, in her famous book, entitled it, I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings, as she tells her story about uh, racism and being raped and how she had to live through that. So freedom from outward constraints is very different from freedom for some purpose or goal. Uh, Freedom works on these two different levels. But freedom is found in the words of Jesus. He says here in chapter 8, Verse 31, to the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold to my teaching, you are my disciples, and then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. That's another line that comes from John's gospel I think we might be familiar with. Now, those who are listening to him, particularly the Pharisees, answer him. We are Abraham's descendants and have never been slaves of anyone. Uh, That's not true. They were slaves all the way back to the Exodus. They were slaves in Egypt. They were slaves in Babylon. They were slaves in uh, 
Persia. They were slaves to Greece. They were slaves now, currently, as this uh, is being read, to Rome. But Jesus says in verse 34, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a song, a son belongs to it forever. So if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. So freedom is an important theme that pops up as well. Uh, truth. I think all of us know probably uh, that famous statement of Jesus when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. But there's no more poignant episode in the Gospel of John when Jesus, than when Jesus appears before Pilate. So there's this false uh, trial that is set up. There's these two false witnesses that uh, claim that Jesus blasphemed, and uh, they set up a trial. But before the Jews that are in power can execute Jesus, they have to get permission from Rome. And so they take Jesus before Pilate. And the famous episode is uh, when Jesus is talking with Pilate, he begins talking a little bit about truth. And it says here, Jesus said initially to him, 1836, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. And Pilate said, you are a king then? Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. And here comes the famous phrase. Pilate responds, what is truth? It's another way of saying everyone has their own fake news. Everyone has their own fake news. In other words, there's no such thing as truth. All you have is everyone's different perspectives on reality. In fact, things can be twisted and turned, and facts can become fake news, in other words. And it seems as though all Pilate really believed was that fake news is everywhere, so I have to use my own fake news to continue in my position. But Jesus will claim to be the truth, and he will go to the cross as a way of showing that his truth will produce all these other things, justice, love, spirituality, beauty, freedom. Now that brings us to the last theme, and that is power. It seems as though Jesus languishes under the power of everyone else, the Pharisees, the Roman Empire, and so forth. Um, but power is seen very different, differently in the Gospel of John. Power is not from the top down in John's Gospel. It's from the ground up. And so I go back and I close my message with this. In John chapter 13, when he's in the upper room with his disciples, it's interesting that the very first thing Jesus does as the disciples come into the room is he gets up and he takes off his outer garment. He bows down and he washes his disciples' feet. And it is there he shows the true nature of real power. The power of servanthood. The power of respect. The power of lifting other people up. You remember Peter will push back on that as his feet are being washed. He says, no, 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 no. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus insisted and said, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. And then Peter changes his mind. He says, well, not just my feet, but then wash my hands as well. Wash my head. And then Jesus says this. Those who've had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. And there he introduces the betrayal that will come by Judas, as Judas uses the power of 30 pieces of silver, right? 
to get Jesus arrested and ultimately have him executed. So it is in the encounter of the mystic. Again, that shouldn't freak you out. It's the idea of an encounter and experience with God. You have your own story and you have your own chapters in that walk with God. And every one of them is a gift that has been given to you. The other theme that is in the Gospel of John is the idea of the Holy Spirit. In chapters 14 through 16, it's called his farewell address. And he makes the promise that as he departs, he will give to us his Holy Spirit. So by the proxy presence of Jesus, he walks with us in the course of this life. Stand, and we will close in prayer. So may the presence of the great God be upon you into this new year. May the eye of this great God of glory be upon you as you need wisdom into this new year. May the powerful presence of the great I am be upon you as we face a new year. May the Holy Spirit be felt as we enter into a new year. And may all these things aid us and shepherd us. Lord God, thank you for a brand new year ahead. We thank you for our lives. We thank you for the opportunity to continue to love. And we ask that we'll do a good job of it into this year ahead. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming, everyone. Have a great day.